Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Not a bad evening to have a uh, virtual programming. Thanks so much for joining us. We're so excited to have Kelsey with us for our artist talk um, and have her share her process, her work, and give us some insight into her business. Um, I'm Gina Jambruno, the program director at WBCA. And again, just welcome. Uh, before we Started a few housekeeping items just to um, make this a good experience for all. Please make sure that you are muted and I can do that for you on my end too, but that way we're not hearing a bunch of noises. Um, you can also turn your camera off if you do not want to be visible during the talk. Um, so that's an option for you too. You'll get the best viewing experience if you turn um, your view mode on speaker view or speaker mode um, versus gallery or tile. That way you can see the speaker nice and big and you won't have all those little um, squares that you've seen before. Um, so that might be something you can do on your end to make it a little more enjoyable. Uh, Kelsey welcomes folks to ask questions throughout the talk, so there's not going to be a designated Q&A portion at the end. So feel free if you have a question to utilize the chat function and I'll get the conversation rolling so you can see how it works. And if you have a question, then I'll unmute you um, and you can address Kelsey directly. So feel free to just have this be sort of like a conversation. Um, it, I think it'll be great. And before we get started, I'd like to thank our premier business sponsors, Boyum and Berenscher, Emergency Contractor Services, JL Schweders Building Supply Construction, Mueller Memorial, New Studio Architecture, Schweders Pottery, Steve Gorenson Video, and the Pillars of White Bear Lake. We encourage everyone to go to our website for a complete list of business sponsors. This activity is made possible by the voters of Minnesota through a Minnesota State Arts Board Operating Support Grant, thanks to a legislative appropriation from the Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund. This activity is also made possible in part by the Manitou Fund. Your support makes a difference to us as well. If you're able, please consider a donation to WBCA. I'll include a link in the chat to that as well. Thanks again for joining us and I'll now turn it over to Kelsey. Awesome. Thank you, Gina. Um, so like Gina said, uh, I do invite you to unmute yourself and interrupt me with any questions just so we can keep it super conversational. Um, and then, yeah, I'm just gonna share my screen and get started talking. Okay. Okay, so I'm gonna um, start by introducing myself. How's my volume, Gina? It sounds good to me, Kelsey. Okay, awesome. So I'm Kelsey Sharp. I am a graphic designer turned everything that I do now. And I'm from Santa Fe, New Mexico. And now I live in Minneapolis. So that's a little bit about me. Um, what I do now is run a commercial sign shop. It's called Sharp Design Co. And we do all kinds of um, small batch fabrication and signage projects. And then on the side, I do my own fine art um, projects. So that's a little bit about me. Um, just to talk you through the format tonight, I'm going to start by talking about a few projects. And then I'm going to switch gears and talk about a few of the um, different processes that I use. And then um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the business side of what I do. So the first project that I'm going to focus on is my Untitled series, which is um, what I've been sharing a lot on the WBCA social media this week. So this is a series of really large, really graphic um, pieces that I've been working on for the past year. And um, this is what they look like. Um, that one's about 30 inches by 40 inches. That is Baltic birch plywood. Um, created in 2019. 
Okay, so as a part of this um, untitled series of works, I also created um, a series of prints in vinyl to go with them just because these works are really time intensive and I wanted to have something that everyone could take home, but the prints are also on Baltic birch plywood. So that's like a little preview of what those look like. And there's a detail of one of these. There's about six of them right now. Um, and so this is, um, I wanted to share with y'all what my renderings look like. So um, when I'm creating these works, I'm using computer driven technologies to create them. And so I start with a lot of different renderings where I'm doing different color studies and just a lot of different types of examinations of shape and composition. Um, so I just wanted to show you all that. Um, I think like when I do this on the computer, this is my version of sketching. So sometimes I'll start with my um, notebook and I'll start with either watercolor or pencils or whatever medium and start that way and then work into the computer. Um, but more often than not, I'm really starting this work in the computer. Um, so then this is what that piece ended up looking like. So it looks very similar to the rendering. Um, and I'm also not, you know, being exactly true to the rendering. There's still like a certain quality of sketchiness. So when I, and, and I try to keep things that way and have a little bit of spontaneity for myself. So I might have a general concept of what it's gonna look like. And yes, this, this specific one does look pretty close. Um, but I'm not like, once I actually get these pieces built and painted, I'm not like measuring them. I'm literally just taking a nail gun and attaching the plywood um, pieces in a way that makes sense. Um, so here's another rendering of another of that piece from the Untitled series. And there's a picture of what it looks like. And then this is another rendering of one that I'm working on right now. So what I'm kind of thinking now is that um, I want to start uh, incorporating more of the color of the natural plywood into my work. Um, and I also want to get away from uh, the rectangular canvas. So this is a kind of new exploration within the same series. Um, so I obviously am making, um, my own canvas, this back piece is a, is a piece of plywood that I cut to size. So my new, my new way of thinking about this series is like, okay, so I'm making the canvas, right? So I don't necessarily need to be creating a square rectangular canvas anymore. Um, and I think that in our life, in architecture and in design and in our day-to-day -day life, there's a lot of squares and I'm gonna um, give you a little bit more around this so in my work as an artist and a commercial sign maker, I've also gotten the opportunity to collaborate with a lot of other artists. So that's been really cool. So all of the projects that I'm showing you today, I'm gonna to show you five. Um, they're all created within the past year. So this is all really, really recent work. Um, and this isn't all the work that I've done. This is just a very small section. So. This project um, was where an, another artist approached me um, to work with her to create um, basically a gallery space for her work in the pandemic. So how does a gallery space be different than, than it was before? Because we can't go into enclosed spaces, um, but we still wanna have that fine art and level of detail. So our project here was to build an outdoor gallery. So I built everything and I printed the repro graphics and, and everything like that. Um, this little detail is just showing, um, so this was um, last month. So right in September, it's already getting dark even as early as six or seven, which is like when a reception might start. So we added these little um, LED lights to her displays. So that's just a detail shot. Um, and then this is what it looks like in space. So this was in an alleyway in St. Paul and um, there's about 11 of these fixtures. We're calling them our gallery fixtures. Each fixture is tied to a different artist. Um, 
And so the artist Diana Albrecht is a photographer and this was a reception, but it was also um, a book launch. So the quotes that are, are pictured there are quotes that are from her book. Um, and then this little detail right there, that's vinyl, that's vinyl. So I'm installing these things and working with the artist to create that. And then there's little details. This is um, painted and then that's vinyl. Um, There's that detail of those lights again. And here's kind of a broader picture of what this um, looks like in space, right? So, you know, when you go to um, a gallery, just trying to recreate that experience um, in a way that's pandemic friendly. Okay, so um, another partnership that has emerged out of my work recently is this partnership with Curiosity Studio, um, which is an experimental art space for adults in Minneapolis. And since the pandemic, we've been um, working on developing new ways to um, be an artist studio for artists um, who can't be in community together. Um, so that's been a really big part of my work within the past year. Um, so this photo is something where um, I art directed it and I kind of have these conceptual projects that I'm developing with Curiosity Studio and we're kind of executing different ways to communicate what we're doing um, through visuals. So one of the ways that we decided to um, communicate with other artists is to create these little curiosity kits. Um, so that's something I've been busy doing and um, those just launched this month. And then basically um, we'll be launching one every month through the end of the year. And then, um, you know, in, in 2021 as well. Okay, I'm just scrolling through to see if it. So I know um, Gina said that um, you can have your camera, you know, on or off. I would love it if you feel comfortable to have your camera on. It would make me feel a little bit less like talking to um, myself if you feel comfortable. Yeah, it's great to see you. You look lovely, Gina. Um, okay, so Still Kicking is another project that I completed this year during the pandemic. Um, this is a client um, on the commercial side of the business who approached me um, but for signage for their business, but they did want something more artful. So it's kind of a hybrid project. Um, so what I started with was embroidering um, so I, I reversing a little bit, one of the things that you're probably getting the sense of with my work, hopefully, is that I'm constantly working with new mediums. So I've already showed you, um, you know, three different projects and I'm showing you how I'm working in woodworking and I'm working in art direction and photography and doing all these, these different um, mediums. Because for me, like there's no medium that's off limits. So I'm not a seamstress. Um, but I am a fabricator and I had this concept like could we laser cut acrylic and embroider it, you know, uh, so this this concept emerged as the result of the client kind of having this really um, collegiate and masculine feeling um, and wanting to bring some some softness to their brand. Um, so, like I said, they wanted interior signage to add a branded element to their space. I get this type of commission all the time at Sharp Design Co, where a client just wants you to install their core values on the wall in their space. And um, it's kind of like, what can we do to make it a little bit more artful than just say integrity, you know, honesty or, you know, so. So um, that's the space before. This is, um, so like I said, my background is in um, graphic design and um, a little bit of that kind of work. So 
this is what my renderings look like when I'm um, on that side of the business. So kind of pitching a concept to the client and then, um, you know, maybe refining it over up to three rounds of revisions and then executing it. Um, and we do all of that in house. So we're doing the design, we're doing the fabrication. Um, so this is what that end result looked like. So that's like the really cool thing about using computer aided technologies to create this work, right? The rendering looks like the reality. This is um, a photo of what the space actually looks like now. It's not a rendering. Um, and obviously it's been brightened up. But um, so yeah, I think this is kind of one of those rare commercial projects that has kind of a sweet spot where there was a little bit of space to play and have a little bit of artful expression um, rather than just being straight up technical signage. Kelsey, I have a question. Yeah. <laughs> Is your creative process different working when um, commercial projects versus your own art and your own personal art projects? Okay, thank you for asking that. Um, my process is different because when I'm working on my own projects, the stakes are much less high. And um, there's maybe less rounds of revisions because I've already gone through several rounds of revisions in my head with a concept before I even bring pen to paper or you know mouse to clicker or whatever. Um, when there's a client involved, um, even if the client is another artist, it's, it's much more, it's a much more long development time. So there's a much longer lead time on a project like this. Um, this was executed between um, March and May of this year. So longer amount of time from the initial contact through to execution um, would be the big thing. Um, and then, yeah, I think um, because the client work can be so demanding, it's really, really important for me to just have my work be something where, you know, some of these pieces that I showed you before uh, in the Untitled series, some of those can be like a one day build. So it's really, really important for me to just have that space to like um, kind of sketch and stretch and do something a little bit different when you've been working on projects that have these longer lead times. Um, and that's that's only um, one of the ways that they're that they're different. Um, yeah. Okay, there's a detail shot of those. So um, if you can imagine, this was like quite a bit of um, embroidery. Each one of those banners is like 24 inches. So uh, actually on the smallest side, they're 24 inches. So they're really big. Um, and that's quite a lot of embroidery. But if you look at the bottom there, you can see where the holes are actually pre-laser cut, which gives you this really nice uniform um, path to stitch it within. Okay. So yeah, you saw the space, you saw that. And the last project that I'm gonna talk about is Forge and Foundry. This is um, another project executed this year during the pandemic um, on the strictly technical signage side of things. So I've kind of showed you a spectrum starting with the Untitled series through to this. Um, and this is the most, the most straightforward one. So in an instance like this, a client is opening a new establishment or they're rebranding, you know, or renting a new space and they come to me and they just want signage. So this is what that would look like. Um, so I hand painted that line of text at the top using um, a series of stencils, which I generate with um, my uh, computer and with a laser cutter or whatever process I decide to use. Um, and then that bottom line that says distillery, that's in vinyl. So I, I actually um, use a lot of, a fair amount of vinyl in my work. So like I said, with the Untitled series, I had those vinyl prints on plywood. And then here, I also use the vinyl plotter, which is right here but behind me um, on, on the technical side of things. So they also got, um, what is called a blade sign. So this is um, another sign for that same business. Um, the background is hand painted and um, yeah, it's fabricated by me. It's really lovely. Um, you can see here, I'm showing a detail of what those letters look like. Those are white acrylic letters. Um, those are laser cut. And then the copper details on top are um, vinyl. 
And if, if you have more questions, I can get really into the detail of how exactly that works and how that's applied. But otherwise, I'm just going to um, move into the processes part of things. I have one more question before you. Yeah. So what kind of considerations do you make? And maybe you'll get into it in your process. Mm -hmm. What types of considerations do you make when choosing the materials for a sign? I mean, does weather play into it? Is it whatever you're inspired by? How do you make those choices? Um, so I work with a lot of different types of materials. And one of the big considerations is weather. Another big consideration is budget or cost. Um, and then other considerations are, like I said, I'm just the type of person who like, if there's one thing that you walk away from today with, it's just like that I'm a very experimental person. So, you know, I think that those um, still kicking co um, embroidered signs, those didn't need to be embroidered. There was no reason why those needed to be embroidered, but I'm just wanting to push the boundaries of what we think of when we think of certain mediums. So again, with the Untitled series, you know, I'm, I'm wanting to push the way that people think about woodworking and how wood can perform. Um, but then on the technical side of things, I have to uh, make sure that signage performs at a certain level and there's kind of certain industry standards and expectations. So um, there's not a high tolerance for imperfection. So that's kind of where some of these processes lend themselves in handy that you can get a very exact cut um, unless the aesthetic is kind of more handmade or craft um, type of aesthetic. But in an instance like this, um, I'm thinking about industry standards. It's honestly not super, super interesting. This is a powder coated steel sign frame. So in Minnesota, um, this is really a standard because of the weather in Santa Fe where I'm from. It was very common for me to make signs all out of wood. Um, the wood could be basically unprotected. The hardware could even be wood because it's a very um, dry, arid climate without a lot of, um, you know, insects, without a lot of moisture. Um, so here, you know, insects would eat away at a wood sign. The winter weather would destroy it. Um, so like I said, this is a steel sign, powder coated. Uh, the letters are acrylic. The vinyl will probably be the first thing to go, you know, probably looking at replacing vinyl every three to five years. But honestly, um, businesses are rebranding and updating that often. So it's not even that big of a deal. Otherwise we'd touch up the vinyl. Um, the background is uh, painted. It's painted with an enamel paint, which is another layer of protection for the core of the sign. Um, so I think over time, the materials that I have used have also changed as I've gotten more into the world of contracting and constructing. And um, because I really came into this world as a graphic designer, you know, having always my projects being delayed. Um, and I was just like, how hard can it be? I'll make the sign. And so I had no previous experience doing this type of work. And then now, kind of four or five years later, I'm at a point where I'm getting more deep into the sign world and I know kind of what's standard. Um, so the core of this sign is just a standard, um, really uninteresting kind of MDF equivalent um, that is suitable for exterior. <laughs> um, yeah. Thanks for the question, Gina. Okay, so into processes. Um, the first process I'm gonna talk about is CNC routing. Um, I'm wondering if anyone has any familiarity with that process. So CNC routing is basically um, a drill bit, um, like would be on the tip of a hand drill, um, but it's on an X and Y axis. So it could, this picture on the right is, and I hope that's on your right too, um, the picture on the right is kind of showing um, what kind of results you can achieve on the artful side of using a CNC router, but I'll also show you projects of what you can achieve on the technical side of using a CNC router. So this is um, the CNC router in process. So this big hose that's over on the right side of the screen um, is a dust collection system and it's collecting sawdust out of the holes at, at, as the drill moves through the piece of wood. Um, 
right now in this picture, there's a piece of plywood that is clamped down to the bed of the CNC router. Um, but I think that it's really important for y'all to know that a CNC router can be used on all different type of materials. This can also be used on plastics and for many, many different types of applications. And a lot of projects that you have in your day-to-day -day life are created using a machine just like this. Um, oh, this is random. Oh. Well, these are, um, I'll come back to this. So another process uh, that I use a lot in my work is laser cutting and laser engraving. Um, the picture on the right is an example of laser engraving. Um, so it's actually engraving the artwork on the surface. Um, this is a picture where the laser engraving is being used for technical signage, but I, I also want y'all to know that this type of machinery is very, very often used in the fine arts now. Like if you can start to think about how you would use this machine, it could be used for block printing and um, really, really different, interesting type of um, artful expressions. Hey, Kelly. Um, like we have mm -hmm. a question from Larry. Larry, do you mind if I unmute you so you can? Larry, go ahead. Yeah, I was just wondering where you learned graphic design and, and what you learned after you learned it. I mean, what you learned in the work world. Oh, yeah. OK, so to introduce myself even more deeply, um, I am from New Mexico. I, I went to the University of New Mexico and I actually um, did not study graphic design. There wasn't even a graphic design program there. If you've ever been to New Mexico, um, it's a pretty more um, rural environment. So I actually studied architecture and construction methods. Um, and even there, more niche construction methods specific to um, the building processes that are historic to the Southwest. So graphic design is not what I went to school for at all. I thought I wanted to be an architect. I hated architecture school. And then I got a job that I totally was not qualified for doing graphic design um, at a firm who needed someone um, who could do some rendering of their graphic arts. So even in my first design role, I was in a position where as the most um, junior designer on the team, I was often having to interface directly with vendors, um, different contractors and stuff like that. Um, so that's a little bit about my, my background. So I really got into this position and they were very gracious to teach me kind of the design side of things. And I think, um, you know, when I was growing up, my mom would always say like, um, a child will show you what they wanna be when they grow up by the time they're seven years old. And when I was like seven, I really thought I wanted to be a fashion designer. And I think that it was because it was the only creative career that I knew. So I've always been wanting to do different creative careers. And I think I thought architecture was really creative and it's not. And I think I thought, um, you know, being a graphic designer at a firm was really creative. It wasn't, so now I'm doing this, um, yeah. Thanks for asking, Larry. Um, and I think that having that computer background uh, has been something that's really made me be able to bridge the gap between this fabrication technology and um, the design world. Um, and it's interesting because I definitely don't think that that's a two-way street, um, but it can be. So laser engraving and laser cutting. Um, that's a process that I use very, very often. So I have lots of examples. This is um, a piece, a, a technical example. So this is um, laser cut acrylic. And here is, um, so one of the questions that Gina asked was about selecting materials. And for me, again, I'm an experimenter and I really wanna be always pushing the boundaries and doing novel things. and. I also wanna be playing with economy to make my artwork accessible to um, many different price points. Um, and so this was a project where I used cardboard um, because the price point was very low. Um, and that was because this was for a temporary installation. So like literally a one day installation in a Sphinx. 
Um, so in the background, what you're seeing there is the laser engraver and cutter. And I hope that you can start to get a comprehension of how the laser is able to move back and forth across the x-axis. And it can also move um, frontwards and backwards across the y-axis. So there's no curves in the world of these type of machines. You know, curves are created by different points on the x and y-axis. Um, and so I was using the laser engraver on this project also because there was a high volume. So when you're working with high volume projects, um, which is a lot of what I do, um, it's really important to have, you know, this type of machinery at your disposal. So uh, I, I'm going to introduce you to a keyword that I like to use. Um, you know, people will often say small batch. And in my world, we have a term that's small batch for the fabrication world, and that's called micro manufacturing. So for small quantities, you know, um, the biggest quantity of anything I've ever produced is like 5,000, which would be small for many companies. Um, we're doing small batch fabrication projects at Sharp Design Co. Um, and here's what that installation looks like installed in the space. Um, so just kind of creating an artful backdrop for a photo booth at a one night event. Um, so you can see why we, what we decided to use um, cardboard. Um, this is a finished product, and this is a sign for a company that was created also using only laser cutters. So the laser cutter is used to cut the wood in this instance. It can be used to cut pretty shallow or thin pieces of wood. Um, it can be used to cut acrylic, all different types of things. Like I said, cardboard, whatever. Um, so now I'm going to show you a few images of a project that uses both of the processes that I just introduced you to. This project uses CNC and laser to create um, the end result. So this, this is kind of um, just giving you a hint at what type of artful expressions are possible with machines. You know, I'm never using these machines to cut a right angle. I'm always trying to be playful. Um, so here's the end result of what that project kind of looks like. Um, and I have another detail shot for you. Um, so yeah, these are, these are the type of small batch fabrication projects that I often get approached with. Um, sometimes it'll be like, I got an email today from someone asking me to cut somewhere between like I have max 300 of a leather um, book, like a uh, gosh, bookmark. And then, you know, this was something where it was producing 50 units. Um, so each unit is created using um, two of these CNC cut pieces of wood and then a piece of acrylic, which is sandwiched between the two pieces of wood. And that's how it's able to stand up right like that. Okay, so one of my favorite processes is um, plasma cutting. Um, I've done a lot of metalworking in the past and um, welding and stuff like that. And just using the same kind of concept of the X and Y axis that's seen in CNC router and laser cutter, uh, that's, that can kind of introduce you to the concept of the plasma cutter. So you can, you can see this, this device is very similar X, Y axis and it's um, laying there. Uh, there's a liquid bed and, and it's kind of a, a water mixture with a little bit of gel in it that's really um, flame retardant because when you're cutting metal, you're using an extremely high heat, like higher than we would ever know um, to cut through metal really quickly. Um, so this gel liquid is just to absorb the flames. Um, so this is kind of cool because this shows you um, what's cap what the plasma cutter is capable of. You can also see the machine again there in the back from a different angle um, and the X and Y axis, which is called the gantry. Um, so one of the things that I point out to you here that's like always been a really interesting consideration to me is another keyword. Um, here, if you look at the points in the M, you can see like in certain places, they're not that sharp. Um, and I'm wondering if anyone knows why that is. Oops, oops. If you would have any, um, any uh, 
curiosity or any sort of hunch of why the letters are not super sharp at certain points. Okay, I'll tell you. So um, the letters are soft at certain points and that's because they're, when the plasma beam is shooting through the metal, there's a certain diameter of that beam of plasma. So the diameter of the beam kind of limits the, con it, there's, it creates a constraint to how, um, how sharp of a detail you can get. And that's something that you'll see um, with, with the CNC cutter and with the laser, uh, you won't see it as much as the laser cutter, but it's called the kerf width. So the thickness of the whatever's cutting, even if there's no actual blade is a really important detail consideration. Um, because you might start to see things where pieces aren't perfectly slotting together. And that's because the kerf width um, could be like up to even a quarter of an inch, which is a lot of, um, of material removal to where your pieces aren't fitting together perfectly. Okay. So here's another finished sign for y'all. And then the next process I'm going to talk about is 3D printing. Um, so this is kind of misleading because it's a 3D printed object on the bed of a laser cutter. But this is, um, yeah, this is a 3D printed um, positive. And this is something else that's 3D printed. It's actually the same object. So 3D printing is really another interesting um, medium that I like to work with because um, like I said, kind of using this 3D modeling um, background uh, to think about space in a certain way has really helped me to push the boundaries of like what I think 3D printing can be used for. It's used a lot for prototyping, but I think it can also be used in really interesting ways to be your end result. Um, so this is some, this is another um, award fabrication project that I'm working on for a nonprofit in town called um, Art Buddies. Okay, so I'm going to talk to you about other processes that I like to use. Um, like I said, the vinyl plotter is a big part of my work as an artist and then on the sign making side of things too. Um, oops. And then the vacuum former is a new kind of tool for me. And that's something that can be used in conjunction with a lot of these other things. Um, I'm really big into all the different um, hobbyist and maker television shows like Making It with Amy Poehler. And then um, there's the guy, Adam Savage, who um, is one of the guys who used to be on Mythbusters. And now he has his own kind of spinoff where he's just like, you know, in his garage experimenting with different fabrication technologies. Um, and he has a really interesting one recently where he's using a vacuum former um, and basically it can be used to create molds for literally like confections, for woodworking, for um, resin, for all different types of applications. So that's a really cool and interesting one for me. Um, and then I think there's a lot of um, hand tools. So like what I would call a hand tool, like a table saw, a circular saw, a drill press. And I call those hand tools because for me, a lot of times when I'm building, I'm really relying on the machine to get things perfectly right. Like it's way easier to tell the machine, okay, drill a quarter inch hole than to actually drill a perfect quarter inch hole straight down in a piece of wood using your hands and the drill press. Um, and then I love using um, a heat gun, always comes in handy, and a nail gun always comes in handy. Um, I just didn't wanna break these out into all the different projects that use them because all of these projects are using a lot of these different um, types of machinery. So um, that's just some, this is some really cool vinyl from a project that I'm working on where we're using um, this chrome gold vinyl and then this so this basically the chrome and gold to create um, an installation in this space that is inspired by the space is a salon so the installation is inspired by the concept of how like a woman might look with um, hair foils in her hair um, if you know what those are um, and then I just included a pretty picture of some leather too to remind you again my favorite thing is experimenting so I like to work with leather sometimes if I'm able to um, and just like use these type of materials in unexpected ways. Um, I think too, in my, in my work at Sharp Design, one of the things that's been really um, 
interesting is being able to experiment and play and pitch like crazy concepts to clients. Um, and another just detail shot to show you about some hand machining. Um, and then, yeah, I think I actually will open it up to questions and just kind of like conversation for, for you all. And I'm gonna um, keep my screen sharing on so that if you all do have um, a specific slide that you wanna reference, I can just like um, jump to it. I have one more question, Kelsey. Yeah. Um, so I think what you studied in college is so interesting, even though you didn't really end up in that path, but I'm sure it influences you. But um, are there any like eras of sign making? It sounds like you looked at historical um, architecture in Santa Fe. Is there like an era um, that really inspires you um, graphically? Um. There's not an era that really inspires me, um, but I mean, like, I think in the graphic design world, you do see, you know, you do see lots of different eras. And I think there's this really interesting thing um, going on right now where we're so, as designers and creatives and artists, we're so introspective on what we're creating in this moment that it can almost be kind of paralyzing. Um, because we're like, what is the new latest thing? You know, like, every, like for example, right now, everyone's trying to be the next Chobani. Um, so there's not necessarily a specific era, but um, I think there is a specific region. So for me, I feel like one of the things that I've, I've really drawn from on a lot of my project-based work is Santa Fe and the American Southwest um, and the type of signage and the type of motifs that are there. Um, and I think that um, especially architecturally. So a lot of that stuff that's really special is from a specific era, um, which is kind of like the Route 66, you know, um, gas station um, kind of aesthetic. And I really like that aesthetic um, because it has a lot of parallels to um, the, the, the current aesthetic of like the machining and contracting world. Um, and I feel like for me, that's almost kind of like timeless. Um, yeah, thank you for the question. <laughs> Are there any other questions? You can type it uh, right into the chat function below. Or yeah. if you can do that, you can wave your hand and I can unmute you too. <laughs> Yeah, and if you if you um, want to reach out with a question later because you're feeling shy, I will. Um, totally respond. Oh, here's one more question from Larry. Larry, I'll go ahead and unmute you. Go right ahead. Sure. I, I was wondering if you had uh, ever done any experimenting with encaust. I haven't. And actually, I think that's one of those things that's kind of really intimidating to me. Um, and I think in part because I've only seen it used in one specific way. Um, but no, I really haven't. I think, um, I don't know how close this is or not, um, but lately I've been experimenting with resin. And for me too, one of the things there is that um, I feel like I, I got to a certain point within projects where the barrier to entry was so high. So like with resin, for example, it's it wasn't even a medium that I felt that I could comfortably explore on the art side of what I do. Um, I had to like get client work to pay for experiments in resin, which then, you know, those can't be experiments, those have to be executed. Um, but do you, do you know what I'm saying about like kind of um, certain mediums not necessarily lending themselves to experimentation? I think I've just always been intimidated by encaustic one because of the aesthetic that I see it applied with and then two, because it's expensive. <laughs> um, and I think too, like um, one, one last remark on that. I feel like where I wanna be as an artist and a creative is like, um, I kind of want to be um, not within the traditional mediums of like what we think of for a studio artist, you know? Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Oh. 
Well, as Kelsey said to, um, you know, thank you for joining us. We can, if you have any ongoing questions for Kelsey after this, just let us know and we can get you in touch. But um, thank you for a vibrant presentation, Kelsey. Um, if that's it from everyone, we'll wrap up. Um, just one more big thank you for joining us. It was kind of a nice uh, way to spend a snowy evening in Minnesota. <laughs> Yeah, thank you for having me, Gina. Um, I look forward to um, seeing some of you all in space in the future. Yes, thanks for joining us, everyone. Have a good Kelsey, are you there? Okay, I have a question. Um, I don't really know how to phrase it. So I also went to architecture school I'm an artist and I practice design and I guess I wonder how how you balance between the, um, a design practice and an art practice and the business yeah. and also like your own personal interest. You know what I mean? Um, okay, I actually love that question um, because I didn't even get into all of my um, business side of things that I've learned of balancing those two. Um, so thank you for asking, um, Toma. Uh, I feel like one of the things that's been kind of crippling to me in this moment is like, I feel a lot of pressure as an artist to share the process, which I, I mean, I think sharing the process has been a valuable tool to um, gaining visibility, right? Um, so by letting people in on, you know, whatever you, you gain more visibility, but then once you let people in on the process, when it's really not at that point yet where it's ready to be shared, then it can be kind of paralyzing in the sense of like, oh my God, well, even my sketches have to be perfect. Like everything has to be perfect. Um, so I think that's something that I'm still navigating, um, and yeah, I think too, you know, as a commercial, on the commercial side of things, I know what sells. So it's hard not to let that bleed into what I create on the art side of things. Mm -hmm. um, because it's like, well, I know which color compositions sell and I know which dimensions work best for above the couch, you know? So it's kind of like, kind of, uh, it's kind of an, it's something that I'm ongoing um, to be challenged with. Um, but I think, um, yeah. That's, you let me know. <laughs> <laughs> no, I love that. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for asking. Are there any other questions before we wrap up this evening? No. All right. Well, thank you. Thanks again to everyone. And thank you, especially Kelsey. Yeah, thanks for having me. Have a good night, you all. Bye-bye. Thank you.